the following clip, I'll provide you with an introduction to legal theory. Legal theory is a subdiscipline of law that is guided primarily by two questions. What is law, and why do people obey the law? The questions are distinct, but the answer to one will necessarily influence the answer to the other. For example, in response to what is law, legal positivists have suggested that law is whatever the sovereign says is law. In the UK, the crown is the sovereign, though the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy means parliament is the supreme lawmaking authority. So whatever parliament says is law, is law. Now why do people obey the law? According to legal positivists, it's because people believe in the validity of laws that grant the sovereign authority to make law. For example, the Magna Carta, making the law legitimate. But this is only one perspective. One strand of natural law theory argues that law is whatever God says is law, which, depending on the particular religion, can be gleaned from holy texts, pronouncements by religious courts, prophetic traditions, and more. In this instance, People obey the law because membership to a particular faith presupposes subordination to that faith's moral code. A third perspective, that of critical legal theorists, argues differently. What these theorists have suggested is that law is whatever those with power say it is. People obey the law because these same powers are capable of doing bad things to a person who doesn't. Of course, this statement begs another question. How do we identify a legal theory? As one scholar put it, what's the magic ingredient? Beyond the questions mentioned earlier, a legal theory attempts to do a number of different things, though none exclusively, and many of these things can be categorized in terms of features. For starters, some theories will describe the law as it is, while others will describe the law as it ought to be. Take, for instance, third world approaches to international law, legal theorists. What these scholars have convincingly demonstrated is that human rights law is hardly consistent, and that it is commonly used against some states, but not against others. It is difficult to challenge the point, as we regularly see countries such as Libya, Cuba, China, condemned for their human rights violations, while violations by countries such as the UK, the US, and Israel are often accepted as necessary evils. Third world approaches to international law theorists will bring these contradictions or double standards to our attention as they are primarily concerned with describing the law as it is. Now we can contrast this theory with another, say for instance natural law theory, where emphasis is placed on the law as it ought to be. Accordingly, when faced with these contradictions and double standards within the human rights project, the response from many natural law theorists is not to question the viability of the project as it has been conceived, but rather to argue for more time and more effort to ensure that human rights law are respected by all. Whether you agree with the conclusion reached by twail theorists or natural law theorists is rather irrelevant. What is important to grasp is that on one hand we have a theory that describes the law as it is, and on the other hand a legal theory that describes the law as it ought to be. The aspirations are distinct. Another important feature to consider is that some theories will prescribe a normative framework. Some theories will offer recommendations in resolving practical problems, and yet some theories will do neither, preferring to simply describe a situation. Take natural law theory once again. Natural law theories are structured around a principal normative framework. Human rights law is one such framework. Now, the standard for human rights law is human dignity. Through a human rights lens, human dignity is the standard by which we assess immigration laws, the provision of education, or even laws that regulate access to medicine. In contrast to natural law theory, we have law and economics. Law and economics theorists prefer to tackle specific problems and, through an application of its norms and principles, put forward a series of solutions. Richard Posner, for instance, argues that orphans should be auctioned off as this will ensure that the most desirable children go to those would-be parents who want them the most, as established by their willingness to pay more money. The most desirable children reaching the most desiring parents makes for an efficient process and is thus most likely to yield a most happy family. The moral questionability of the process of selling children or the discrimination in tying access to orphans to the size of an estate is irrelevant. What matters to law and economics theorists is efficiency of the process, which they believe is best achieved through a monetized regime. Critical legal theorists, on the other hand, 
will rarely offer a solution to breaches of human rights or to the overcrowding of orphanages, nor will they put forward a normative standard by which these are meant to be regulated. What they prefer to do is to describe the situation as well as the circumstances that give rise to it, but they will often remain silent as to the next step. To recap then, some theories will propose a normative framework, some theories will try to resolve specific problems, and others will simply describe the legal landscape. A third feature that we might consider is that of universal applicability. Some theories will claim universal applicability, while some theories do not. To use human rights law again, the human standard is intended to be all-encompassing, notwithstanding differences in color, in creed, in gender, or in class, or in fact in any other identifying mark. By virtue of our inherent humanity, we are all equal. The law should be structured accordingly, or so say universalists. Legal pluralists, on the other hand, argue that being human means different things to different people. Our expectations, our aspirations, our interpretations are a direct result of our color, our creed, our gender, our class, or other identifying characteristics. Accordingly, a relativist approach, one that allows each community to structure their normative preferences autonomously, makes the most sense. So universal applicability on one hand, and cultural relativity on the other. There are other features as well. Some have suggested that a legal theory must be capable of organizing or streamlining collective views, and by extension, bring order to society. Others do not. Some suggest that a legal theory must be explicable in the abstract so as to not be data-specific, and thus of value in varied instances. Others are unsure as to how general or how abstract a theory must be. The list goes on and on. To conclude, there does not appear to be a single magic ingredient that makes a legal theory what it is. Short of thinking about the phenomenon of law, its creation, its application, its course of power, its conditioning power, there do not appear to be any hard and fast components to a legal theory. To quote one scholar, legal thought and legal theory are much closer than is generally supposed. Legal theory is not a special category of legal thinking. It is legal thinking. To sum it up then, we use legal theory to better understand how the world works and how it doesn't. In the following clips, I will provide you with a brief overview of certain key legal theories that you are likely to encounter during your legal studies.